And so I want to introduce Jonas. You are in for a treat. I always describe his voice as slow jazz. He's very easy to listen to. Um, over 20 years ago, while working at his family nursery, Jonas began his bonsai journey when he met Boone. At that experience kicked off more than two decades of study with Boone. During that time, Jonas started his own website and blog, Bonsai Tonight. I encourage everybody to sign up for his weekly blog. It's they're short, but very informative articles. Um, in 2015, Jonas turned his hobby into his full-time profession. He began running the Northern California Bonsai Nursery where he continues to teach and write about bonsai. Today, Jonas grows a variety of tree species, specializing in developing Japanese black pine from seed. Some of us are a little too old for that. Anyway, he is the author of the Little Book of Bonsai and the Bonsai Tonight blog, as well as co-founder of the Pacific Bonsai Expo that's at the end of October that you do not want to miss. I guarantee you, you're in for a treat. Please welcome Jonas Dupuy. Very good to see you all. Um, I've been told Sacramento's like this every day of the year, weather-wise. Is that accurate? I'm all, if so, I'll be moving next week. It'll be great. Tonight, we want to talk about bonsai valuation, and I'm curious what comes to mind when you hear that phrase. Like, does that mean anything to you? How do you look for a new piece of pre-bonsai specifically, or possibly how to shop, or kind of what would go into that acquisition phase? Paul, what comes to your mind when you hear that topic? Bonsai evaluation, what does that mean? And so for those who didn't hear, uh, what Paul just went through are kind of the basics of what we look for in bonsai. He mentioned the trunk, its establishment or time in training as a bonsai, and the different characteristics for the different parts of the trees. We'll be looking at all of this stuff later today. One thing I'm curious about from you all is, do you all feel like you have a perfect understanding of what it is we all look for when we're developing our trees? There's no just book you can look at that tells you what it is that we need to try to develop in our trees, what characteristics for every single species and size and style that doesn't exist. How many evaluation programs have you ever been to over your, in some cases, three and four decades long career in bonsai? Have any of you even been exposed to the idea of evaluation in bonsai? Anybody ever? Say more. Thinking every time you look at a tree, aren't you thinking, how does it strike me? What's great about it? What needs improvement? I don't know. Every time I look at a tree, I think about those things, but I don't know if that's true for everybody. And a personal relationship to the characteristics of a tree is a big part of it. But if the only thing that mattered about a given bonsai is my relationship with it, that might not have any bearing on the price of the tree. It might not have any bearing on anything else. Let's approach this topic a totally different way. How many of you are 100% confident you've paid the appropriate amount for all the material you've bought over the years? That is an asymmetric situation. What you're saying is that the people you are buying from may know more or less than you when you're shopping. Does that feel good when you're the one that knows less? Well, then why aren't there more programs, books, topics, lectures, and articles teaching you what it is that these other people theoretically know. I applaud the leadership of the club who decided they wanted to hear this topic and actually speak about this topic more than almost anything else, especially in light of a show that some friends and I and many of you have helped put on the Pacific Bonsai Expo, which we'll be doing this fall in Oakland. And that is a juried exhibit, as in people will take pictures of trees, they will submit them to members of a jury, and these people will independently evaluate which trees they think deserve admission to the exhibit. And then based on what they do, we kind of mix everyone's results together and that's what you end up seeing in fall. How many of you here are submitting trees to the exhibit? The deadline is in another few weeks. I see one, two, three, four hands raised. I know there's at least a fifth, a sixth, and a seventh, eight. Yeah, yeah. So a bunch of your club members are participating in it. These people might have a clue about what we're talking about tonight. They could be really good resources if you have questions about your own trees in terms of what you're going for. 
and they might look you directly in the eye and say, no, actually, I'm just as curious about that topic as you. So, but do start with them because these are people that have likely been in bonsai either long enough or have worked seriously enough that they've started to get some kind of an idea for what kind of characteristics um, for. Before I jump into the program program, are there any things you're very curious to hear from me on this topic? Just based on that little introduction, you care nothing about prices, you care nothing about what to develop in your trees, you all have a perfect idea of where to go from here, and that this will just be the frosting on the cake that I'll be delivering. If you have any questions up front, let me know now. If not, interrupt at any point during the presentation, and we can get to that. Yeah, raise your hand, then we'll call. Do you have the slides up in handy? All right. So there are a lot of different ways to evaluate trees. And some of your comments just now were really good starting points for that. How do the trees make you feel? How do the different, how do you respond to different parts of the tree? One way to think of it is to look at the whole tree as a whole. And so if I were going to say about this tree right here, if just ignore all other details, you don't even know, need to know what kind of a tree it is. But if I said, you know, on a scale of one to five, how many points would you give that tree? With no other context now, just start shouting out some numbers. What would you give it? Four. Four. One to five. One to five. Just throw out a number for the whole thing. Five is best. Three, four, three, three and a half, four. All right, next slide. If I were to ask the same question, what would you give this tree? Yeah, there aren't enough points, are there? So go back to the first tree. So this is a Zelkova serrata, Zelkova or a gray bark elm. And instantly you're getting an idea that one thing to consider when we're evaluating bone size, what are we comparing it to? And that's gonna have a big effect on what we're going for. What are some good points of this tree right here? Because we got a lot of average and above average scores. On a scale of one to five, three would be average. In other words, of all the Zelkova you've ever seen, half are better than that and half are worse. Is that true for you? Is that, is that an average tree? And you're going to tell me with a straight face, half the Zelkova you've ever seen in this country are, better, are uh, better than that? Well, so was your three too low a score. And so are we thinking of it in terms of what are the other trees we've seen or what we think is possible with a species. So what are some good points of this tree? The roots, I think that's one of the weak points. What's another good point of the tree? I'll say more. What about the branch structure? It has branches. Yeah, the tree's been in training for some time. What else do you think about it? Paul's first comment when I asked about evaluation, he said the trunk. What do you think about the trunk, Paul? not a lot of taper. Instantly, before we get into much more detail about talking about a tree like this, we start to think, what are the conventional characteristics we look for in a broom style Zelkova for, for the species and for the style in which this tree is trained, we have certain expectations. We don't need our trees to meet these expectations, but a connoisseur, someone who spent a lot of time, been to a lot of exhibits, will have an idealized cognitive model. In other words, a basic idea in their head of what a Zelkova is going to look like. Good things about the roots. They all emerge from the same level. Good things about the roots. There are roots all the way around the trunk. Bad thing about the roots. They look like chopped off fingers just laid at the base of the trunk. That's not the most beautiful type of roots. And that's a common thing. People say, oh, if I can see the roots, they must be good. Bigger, the better. But I would say that a root that's 20, 30 percent of the size of the trunk is typically not graceful for this style. Better if the base of the tree kind of had a little bit of flare and it divided much more quickly into much, much finer roots. In terms of the taper of the trunk, in the broom style, we want most of the branches to emerge from the same point and we want a very straight trunk. We don't actually need a lot of taper for this style. A little bit of taper is fine, but we don't actually care about that. And in terms of the twigginess, we can kind of comment about, do we like the way the branches are arranged? Um, is the density even? Does it look like it was done skillfully? Are the inner nodes appropriate for the size and scale of the tree? We can ask a lot of kind of questions like that. 
But in terms of the overall number, it depends on what our basic criteria is. If I were walking around the best show in the world and I saw this tree, I would wonder what it's doing there. If I saw it in a club show, I'd say, that's a nice alcova. Now go to the second slide again. How many of you recognize this tree? It's a very famous tree. This was actually one of the logo trees for the uh, one of the most famous bonsai exhibits of all time, the World Bonsai Convention held in Saitama about five years back. And it's a Japanese beach made by a guy, Mr. Oishi. And it's actually not that big a tree. It's probably only about this tall, um, but it's absolutely spectacular. It's not that old. He made this tree from an air layer. But if any of you have ever grown Japanese beach before, you'll know that it is not a gimme to make things this dense. Peter, would you say that's a gimme, that level of density on a Japanese beach? Doable, yes, it exists. But is that a gimme? Is that the average density you'd see on a beach? No. What about the even density from top to bottom? It's a little heavier on top, a little bit lighter on bottom. How hard is it to get them perfectly balanced top to bottom? Pretty hard. So there's a lot of other stuff starts coming to mind. When I'm thinking of this tree, it's kind of a funky style. It's like a modified clump style bonsai. I kind of ignore that and just appreciate that it looks old. It looks impressive. And if you know anything about growing beets, you can think that technically an extraordinary amount of work went into this. Whether or not you even like this style or the approach, not everyone's going to want horizontal branches. Not everyone's going to want a perfectly round cap. But if you look at technically to get a tree with that trunk to look like that, a lot of energy goes into that. And so, yeah, feel free to give this kind of as many points as you want. Let's look at another slide. All right. So what if I just, instead of focusing on the whole tree, ask you to focus on part of the tree? If I were to ask you to grade the trunk only on a scale of one to 10, what would you give the trunk? Just shout out some numbers. Seven. One. One? Seriously? Ten's the best, one's the worst. So you've never seen a juniper with a worse trunk than that? I want to see your collection. <laughs> yeah. What are some other scores? I pretty much only heard seven and one. Eight, nine. All right. Next slide. Okay, on a scale of one to 10, what do we give this trunk? What characteristics do we look for in junipers? Deadwood, say more, what else? Movement, any kind of movement that is particularly important for junipers. Twisting, when possible, particularly for shimpaku junipers. This is a form of shimpaku juniper. We care way more about the movement, the presence of dead wood, the relationship between the live areas, that would be the brown parts, and the dead areas, the white part. Ignore the turquoise, that's a reflection of the awful felt they use at the show. Um, but that's really interesting dead wood on that tree. Now, go back to the previous slide. The trunk is the most important part of the bonsai, and it's the bulk of the value. When you buy a tree, you're buying a trunk. The rest is kind of decoration. When you're styling a trunk, you're answering the questions, what is the most beautiful view of the trunk I can present to the audience? And how can I best decorate the trunk with foliage, with branches? And if I were to ask you to just grade the branch structure on this tree on a scale of one to five, what would you give the branches here? One to five, two, so just below average, four, just above average, three and a half. Someone's just going to keep saying three and a half. I know it. And then go to the next slide. What about the branches on this one? Same scale, one to five. What do you think of the branches? Five. What else? Four. What makes the branches better here? How are you evaluating the presence of branches? What's different between the two? What's that? Distinct pads? And so when you say distinct pads, that would be the kind of blocks of foliage we're looking at. And there are about four and a half, five, maybe five and a half if you count the back there, 
some discrete number of branches. So how the actual bits of foliage are arranged into clusters is one criteria. What's another criteria for evaluating the branches? Say more about balance. Proportions. <laughs> it's pleasing to the eye, somehow it's proportional. Often it's asymmetrical, but still proportional. And so if someone had never seen a multi before and you just used words like proportional and balanced, would that convey any meaning? Would you have a way to characterize what is or no. isn't out of balance? No. I think balance is such a, um, I don't know, I think it's kind of a subjective experience, but for me, this is, has balance. It kind of fits with, I mean, all of the pads kind of fit together and it fits with the trunk. Anyway. And someone else might say that, why is it that all of the foliage is in the top half of the tree and there's no foliage down below? Or why is the silhouette of the foliage almost a circle instead of some other shape? Or why are there not bigger gaps between the foliage and it's just kind of blocky? There's a lot of positive, half full or half empty ways of looking at that. Whereas, go to the previous slide again. Does the trunk offer balance to the bat? Which is so balance is a great catch-all word that if you've ever heard anyone come from Japan and talk about bonsai, they very likely just use the word balance, next question. But it means you need to know everything they know to know what they mean by balance. And so I try to start with balance and say, good, but what would imbalance look like? Because until you can characterize what would make something balanced or imbalanced, it, it doesn't carry as much meaning. Is this Does this lack balance? Everyone scored the other tree higher. So how is that one more balanced than this? Dynamic means so much. So get, make that tangible. Yeah. Do bonsai move? Do any type of bonsai move before our eyes? Because dynamic's a good phrase, but. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I get the point. Now you know why this job is hard. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I know. I get it. I get it. But I mean, it, it depends on what the objective is of the artist, right? So again, it's such a subjective thing, but maybe you want a, a, a dynamic tree that has imbalance, that has more foliage on one side of the tree than the other. There's one tangible definition. One way to look at balance is if you cut a tree off at the base, which way would it fall? Would it be balanced and or would it topple? And in general, most trees would topple one way or the other. And how far in or out of balance, how far those branches reach can have an effect on whether or not we think something's balanced. The heaviness of the trunk, the shape and direction of the trunk is also going to affect how we create a foliar design for the tree. One way to think of how you compare the relationship of the trunk to the foliage is, if I traced this and just gave you a black and white image, if I gave you a picture of that foliage and asked you to draw the trunk, Almost no one in the room would guess the trunk is that skinny. With that heavy a foliar block, you would guess the tree has a really big trunk. And so that foliage is a little bit heavy for that size trunk. So one form of balance is the ratio of the foliar silhouette to the heaviness of the trunk. Go to the next slide again. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. We can talk about this. The, uh, yeah. All I was going to say was the previous tree to me, the dome shape allowed to kind of show emphasis, emphasis into the curve of the trunk itself. So it almost looks like a person's head on the top and two arms kind of leaning over. So to me, it shows more bodily shape versus the nicer tree or what we would deem as a nicer tree. It actually doesn't really complement the movement of the trunk as much because it has a still larger dome on the top. It doesn't it's hidden behind the movement of that wave of the trunk. In the, this in has the much line. more of what we think of as a bonsai design. We can see distinct branches. They do kind of reach forward. There's a little window or a break so that we can see the interesting parts of the trunk. As a very conventional bonsai design, the one thing we might do is lighten it up a little bit, but only a little bit. Whereas the other one, when we go to the, the second tree, like you say, the foliage there's kind of one big diagonal line going to the left. And if the trunk's mostly going to the left, the foliage is mostly going to the right. That is one form, not to give you too hard a time, to give you, yeah, some form of balance. But when you think of those abstract words and you hear them, always try to translate them into something tangible so you know kind of what it is you're talking about. Um, that tree would obviously cost or fetch a higher price than the previous one. I mean, the previous tree is only that big, whereas this tree here is about this tall. 
It's actually not a huge tree, but it does have the characteristics we look for in juniper. So we've only looked at two pairs of trees and already we have completely non-overlapping criteria we apply to them. Is there a place we can look up what characteristics to look for for every species? Yet another obvious thing that the people in front of the room tend to assume everyone in the audience knows, but I don't know how they would learn it unless, how would you learn that? Does this come up in workshops? Does it come up in demonstrations? I don't know. Art school. Western art school basic principles help with a lot of this. Let's look at the next tree. Big bonus points if you can guess what this is, and that's open to any of you. Nope. So if I were to, yeah, no guesses at all. If, uh, if uh, I were to ask you, same thing, to evaluate the entire tree on a scale of one to five, what would you give it? I've messed with your scale enough, you don't know where to go. If this were in your club show and you were judging it against all the other trees in your club show, what would you give this? Five, three, average, four, so average to a little bit higher than average. It's a privet, by the way. When temperatures drop, privets will drop their leaves. Now this is a, was Eric Schrader's tree. A, uh, and interestingly, a criminal fell off a roof and landed on that tree and it just did not make the repot. It's a very dramatic YouTube video if you wanna check it out. I highly recommend Bonsify, it's a very sad video, but Eric kept a stiff upper lip through the whole thing. Uh, next slide. Oh yeah. Yeah, go back to it. <laughs> go back to the previous one. Back to the privet. Yes. Okay. Uh, I I somehow don't like the uh, limb on the right. The one, the lowest limb there. What do you think can improve it? Yeah, he seems to me. Well, if I were, if it were my tree, and I were at home, I'd just wag it off. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> but but it's not my tree and something about it just kind of throws my brain off a little bit you know and so i'm okay with it throwing your brain off but notice how i want to immediately change it a lot of people have the mistake and i don't know where this comes from other than every demo i've ever seen many people think bonsai critiques are an opportunity to make people feel bad about their trees it's an opportunity to point out the improvements you can make in trees that's actually educational a first timer can tell you what's wrong with a tree. And so how do you all think the tree would work without that branch? I actually don't think that's that crazy. I think you could, I think you could make a design either way. It does some really interesting things is this kind of gives some balance there. But I think one thing you might not like about it is it from the trunk, all, it actually comes from behind the trunk. Every little bit of it is isolated. It's not integrated with anything else, whereas all the other branches kind of blur together. That's one thing that makes that look funny. I saw another hand up earlier. Did someone else have a question about that? Okay, go to the next one again. Okay, same thing, one to five. Four and three quarters. The last time I did this, this is a pomegranate, by the way, twisted pomegranate. The last time I did this presentation, a lot of people gave that threes and fours. And they said it lacked negative space. You can guess what they watch on YouTube a lot of. Um, one thing that's really hard about all of these evaluations, and this is a good example, is it's hard to gauge things in two dimensions. If you've never seen a tree this dense, and if you haven't been to Japan, you likely haven't seen many bonsai this dense. And it's hard to understand or have a concept of what the depth of a tree can offer when you actually have tons and tons of fine branches that have been carefully pruned for probably, you know, at least a generation or two. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. But this is a lot more dense than the average tree. And a lot of people actually find this level of density flawed. Please don't cut all of the branches off if you find something like this, because it is a prized characteristic. For deciduous trees, we often want to see a lot of density, but we may not want to see too much density. We may also, it might depend on the species and the style we're going for. 
If you've got a big, powerful trunk with a lot of dramatic movement, you can handle more density. If it's a really graceful trunk, it might look ridiculous with a lot of density. So density isn't a panacea. It's not a one size fits all. It's more like what is the best decoration we can offer for a trunk like that? I'm pretty sure that one actually won the Kokofu Prize. So that, that year, so that was a recognized tree. Forget which year that was, but it was a little while back now. What's in that? So you all on top of the scoring thing, there will be a quiz. You're gonna be scoring these trees very soon. Next slide. All right, black pine. This is a domestic show. Now, what about, let's see. How would you score the trunk on this one? One to 10. Just throw out some numbers. Nine, eight, two, two. Did I hear that right? If you've got a bunch of these twos you're trying to unload, give me a call. I'll buy them all. And what about the branches on a scale of one to five? What would you give the branches? Four, three. So three. So that's average for a black pine. And so there's different ways to interpret threes. I think of it as kind of average, which means in a given show, half the branches would be better than that and half the branches would be worse than that. Or you're coming up with some kind of an absolute score. So what is wrong with those branches that is making it not one demerit, but two demerits below best? What do you, what do you think, since you said three? Uh -huh. Thanks. Uh, you brought up movement of the trunk before. It's just that they're so similar on either side, yet you have the, the trunk moving to the right. Mm -hmm. I just feel that the gain balance, you should have shortened the right-hand side. Well, I'm looking at it right-hand side over there. Shortened it a bit, and that would have given it a bit more balance, in my opinion. So, so let's look at the next slide. How would you rate the branches on this one? Same thing, scale of one to five. Four and a half, five. Four. So still has a long way to go before you get to five. So what's missing in this one? Because if we don't say five, then we then that means we're very clear what the tree's missing. It doesn't mean we don't like it. It means that clearly there's a technical demerit. Well, so what does this tree lack that... If, in other words, if you bought this tree, you would work very hard to make it a five because it's easy to fix branches. Yeah, so what I, would you do on this one? I think for me is that I just can't follow the main trunk line from the from the front of it. I just feel like something should have something could be done so that you could follow the main trunk line and see it and see it a bit more. Yeah. Do you think it's invisible because the styling is wrong or because it's a bad shadowy photo? I really don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. What do the rest of you think? How would you score the trunk on this one? Or could you have enough information to score it? I can't tell. It might have a little reverse taper, it might not. That tree's about this tall. Yeah, kind of a small, large tree. And what do the rest of you think about the branches on a one to five? There, you're right. There is a lot of ramification. You've not seen a lot of black pines in this country that are that dense. So again, from a technical perspective, that is extraordinarily dense. Now, if you keep this in mind, where it's a very full silhouette and every single pad has dozens and dozens of little branchlets, and then go to the previous slide, and you can see there's much bigger gaps between the branches. There are multiple acceptable ways to create branch pads on pines that aren't necessarily inherently better. We can say, for this style of branch pattern, is this as well executed as the other one is as that style? So not only are we saying, is this pine as good a pine as the other pine, but is this type of branches on a pine as good as that type of branches on a pine? That's not going to be on the quiz. But there are always levels of, does the tree evoke characteristics of the species and for the style decisions that have been made by the artist, have they executed them well? Instead, you're going to take away something really simple. What's the number one thing you look for in pine bonsai? Bark. 
and why the bark? Age. If we were going to just really oversimplify everything and say what matters on pines, we're going to say it's always going to be the trunk, and we're going to say bark because of the age, because young pines will typically, there are exceptions of course, will not develop great bark. And it takes good genetics and a long time for good bark to farm. Good bark won't always necessarily form. In fact, there's different patterns of bark you can get on pines. This has long vertical stripes. There are square patterns. There are turtleback patterns. There's a bunch of different types of patterns you can get. And that's just genetics of the tree. And typically the more rare and beautiful the pattern, the more valuable that bark becomes. And so um, go back to the next one, the, the, the subsequent one. Yes, it really is hard to gauge what's going on here, but the plates of bark are probably three quarters to an inch deep. So this tree is really, really old. And uh, technically there's a lot more going on, but I think there actually is room for improvement in the silhouette. It looks a little bit too similar on both sides they both have kind of a blob down below and that it's a very conventional design tree, but overall I'd say it has pretty good flow and flow is kind of a different discussion, which this presentation almost was where we talk about where's the base of the tree in relation to the top of the tree, how big or far out do the different branches reach. That's kind of what you think about when you're designing your tree. But today we're just going to focus on, does it evoke the characteristics of the species? Is there another picture next slide? Okay. For something totally different. Coast Redwood, scale of uh, one to five, the whole tree. How do you score this tree? Three, two. Yeah, question. Yeah. Redwood, so how are you comparing, how are you comparing this to other redwoods? Like, it's, cause it's gonna be the exact answer I had for the black pine. There are very different <clears throat> approaches for how to style redwoods, and that's why I chose this slide. They can be formal uprights that are a, what we think of as a far view bonsai, a tree that you're looking at from far away off in the distance, and it's like a giant tree in miniature. This is more an actual size bonsai. It's a bonsai style, the cascade style redwood, and I will judge it as a cascade style redwood. So against all of the I'll either judge it against all of the other similarly styled redwoods in the room or all of the similarly styled redwoods in my head. I will never say it's inherently inferior because it's in this style. I will say, what, how good a representation is it of that style? It's what allows you to allow a golden retriever to compete against a corgi because they're very different dogs. But is the corgi a better corgi or is the retriever a better retriever? That's how they let those things compete. And it's not dissimilar for bonsai. So what do you think? What score would you give the tree? And if you don't like it and want to score it down, tell us, because then we can have a discussion about whether our opinion plays into our scoring. So three, average, essentially. Four and a half. Two, below average. What makes it below average? Should redwood bonsai have ramifications? We know it's technically possible, but should a redwood have greater density? Do they? <laughs> because the form of branches, I've never seen a bonsai styled actually as a giant tree grows where you can actually follow the foliage all the way down the length of the branch. We haven't figured out good ways to represent that um, in miniature. Either they get really, really dense, but one way you might say that is, it doesn't look like it's been much time in training. It looks young in training. You can still see squiggles from an initial wiring, and we just see these kind of cascading, the same radius turns on every single branch all the way down there. So there are a lot of things we can say about that, but whether or not a redwood has that density in nature, do redwoods have that form in nature? So then do we need to judge the density a different way. In other words, once you kind of go off script, you kind of have to decide what characteristics you're going to apply. And so I've noticed that people do very different approaches to redwood, but this one looks like it's simply early in training. When I see lots of long slender branches that are just kind of going off in every direction, it looks like the tree was, oh, 
that's right, the shows this weekend, cut it to silhouette and put it on the bench. And that's totally acceptable for a show. But if there were five other redwoods that each had more dense branching or more carefully manicured branches, I would probably score those a little higher. All right, is there another slide? What would I score that? Well, I would say, what criteria am I applying? Is this a tree at the US National Show or is it a tree at the ABAS show? Uh, at the National Show, I would score that a two. At the ABAS show, I might score it a three to four, depending on the year. And so when I'm evaluating a show, what I'll often look at is I compare it to the other trees in the room because that's just the easiest criteria to apply. I can close my eyes and just what is the absolute best redwood I can imagine. My vision for that tree is I actually don't mind the basic approach, but give me five years to make the branches prettier. It'll have a nice silhouette and really in two years, it'll look good. In four years, it'll look sharp, you know? And then if you're taking it to a really high level exhibit, some number of years down the road, I think that basic pattern could be fun. But I would also start critiquing how skinny these branches are. That has decent size there, but from here to here, these branches are super skinny. And that just reads young to me. When the trunk is this big, this massive and half rotted out, I don't understand why this looks ancient and massive and from there to there it looks skimpy. I would want to take the time to develop that a little bit and that's going to take a couple more years. But redwoods grow fast and so I'll just say this is young. So that's kind of how I think about it. Now, are there more slides? Oh, a couple more. Oh, California juniper. Actually, how do you score this whole tree? This is a weird one. One to five, whole tree. Five. What do we look for in California junipers? Deadwood. Is there deadwood? Yeah, there's deadwood. What else do you look for in a juniper? Twisty. How often do you see actual twists in California junipers? Not a ton. You see fan shapes, you see big curves, but you don't often see twists. And we have really good twists up top. It's, you know, just a lot more kind of just straight driftwood style kind of deadwood down at the base. What about the roots? Do we care about the roots on junipers? In general, it's conventional to not worry a whole lot about what roots look like on junipers because the best junipers are often collected and are growing in some space that doesn't allow them to develop great surface roots. And so in general, people will often pick a convention, maybe just give all the roots threes for their junipers unless they're distractingly bad or really, really good. Is that distractingly bad or really good? Not everyone loves it, Renee. I'm oh, sorry, Kathleen. Yeah. So the part of that's the photo, but yeah, the artist chose not to brush the trunk. The live vein runs up the side here. You pick it up on the back, it comes around there and then wraps right up there. So there is live vein on it, but they didn't brush it. That is another convention that people do to highlight that contrast between live and deadwood. And so, and some people think it looks artificial when you brush the trunk and heighten that contrast. When you go into the mountains, you will see trees where it is blending in and you'll see other trees where it's actually bright red and it provides tons of contrast it, they do that naturally we get to choose yeah what what do you think is most important the technicalities of uh the way uh many people look at bonsai or individual taste and you know well so how, i how would do, say how do, how do you how do i reconcile that do you rate those that so it depends on the context. If I'm helping someone shop for a tree for their garden, I want the tree that's going to excite them. Because I find that when people really love a tree, they're more likely to learn about it, to be curious how they can make it better, to keep it as healthy as possible, and to make it as beautiful as possible. If I'm evaluating an exhibit and I'm actually scoring trees, I have that more dog show mentality where I want the tree to be technically well executed and beautiful and touching, and it has to make me feel something and have presence. I, I expect the world of trees when I'm evaluating them in an exhibit. 
Does that kind of make sense? Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. You were first. I just sort of piggybacking yeah. off that in a in a judged show. Yeah. Um, do you look more at sort of the natural characteristics of the tree? Like they were lucky to find that tree with those char characteristics or the skill to take maybe not in a as good a piece of material, but the technical aspect of it is amazing. You teed up the next thing I wanted to say. Thank you for that. I cut all trees in half. I say, what did nature bring to the table? And what did the artist bring to the table? Nature gave us that wood. What the artist did was orient it, decorate it with branches, select a container for it, and provide a display context. And so I think of all of those things in an exhibit, depending on what the criteria for that exhibit would be. Sometimes people specifically say, we're just looking at the tree or we're looking at the whole, there's you know some differences in that. But I, I, I really do, when I'm evaluating trees, I think that is a novel solution to the problem or that is a conventional solution to the problem. Or maybe it's novel, but not interesting. And so that's what I really like about thinking of this topic is there's just so many different ways to cut it. Now, what I want to prepare you all to do is to practice some evaluation. Um, can we turn on the lights? All right. Yeah, I don't think we need any more after that. So, yes. On the tree that we just looked at? Yeah, the juniper. You want to put that back up? <laughs> I don't mind. Dodie might mind. <laughs> Okay, well, you've got all the lines in the tree going up yeah. gently, softly, and then going out. Then you've got the three branches going straight down like they fell off. Yes. So there's a lot of things I could pick apart on the design of this tree. And this tree is in the middle of actually being rebuilt right now. I don't know what happened, but they're actually in the middle of root grafting it here and radically condensing the top to make a very, very different bonsai out of it. Um, to address a lot of concerns, the weirdness in the roots, the less interesting lower part of the trunk. In fact, I think they might even be grafting down below, but I haven't seen that tree in a few years, so I don't know. You're talking about that to me looks very strange and those branches do kind of stand out. But one of the challenges is the lowest point of foliage on the tree emerges from the trunk about 80% of the way up. For junipers, this is common. And here's something to keep in mind in general, on juniper bonsai, the lowest branch is often about 50% of the way up on the trunk. And it's very common for the lowest branch to be 70 or sometimes 80%, which is why we so often have these drop branches. Ideally, you don't make it stand out and look like these dangling things. And that's an interpretation. That's your metaphor that the branches have not just been bent down, but have dropped or broken or fallen down like that. And that's, <laughs> so if you were the owner of that tree, your challenge would be to make it not look like that. Were there other comments on this one? All right. Thank you for that. What I want to do next is have, uh, we'll just go through the exercise really quick. It's like on a scale of one to 10, how would you evaluate this trunk? What are your criteria for it? Bark, because it's a pine. What kind of pine? A cork bark pine. So if it's a cork bark pine, we're going to have a different set of expectations. We're going to expect a little less foliar density, and we're going to expect a good view of the trunk. What about the style? It's a very slender, bunjin-ish feeling tree. We're going to look at the line of the trunk and the arrangement, typically quite asymmetrical arrangement of the foliage on it. For the branches, we're going to look at how much would be too dense. It might look really funny to have a big lollipop on top. So again, what do you think about the uh, trunk of how it's presented today on a scale of kind of one to 10? Good answer. There's a lot of hesitancy to judge each other's trees, especially in public when we know the owner is listening. Hold, Ian, look away. Hold up your fingers. How many you got? What would you give your trunk? Usually the owner is the harshest critic. So you've studied this tree and you know the flaws better than we do. What would you give the tree? 
And so would you be, would your scale be set based on what you would expect to see in the club show? And so that's, it kind of requires a little bit of contact. And so let's just say of the trees that are in the room tonight, if you give this trunk an eight out of 10, does that mean it's really good for a cork bark or does that mean it's better than 80% of the trees in the room? Just in general wise, because all these trees have trunks and we're going to give them all scores. In other words, I'm trying to arm you all so that you get over these hangups. And that's why I'm focusing on the things that make it really hard to score. I always think of it as give the best tree in the room a 10, the worst tree in the room a one and try to spread out even distribution. There's a lot of ways to parse that. Uh, statisticians will tell me what's wrong about that. But there are different approaches, but that's an easy one. If you think of five is in the middle, what characteristics does this trunk have above average or below average? And then you bump it kind of up or down for there. What about the branches? What would you score the branches on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how many years worth of ramification? And so you'd want how many more years to get it to your target, you think? TBD. So in other words, you probably wouldn't score the branches higher than say three out of five on that because you know you've got a ways to go on it. And then we didn't talk much about surface roots because they're harder to see. How would you score the roots on the pine? Uh, scale a scale of one to five, one to five. And I'll get to, and I'll tell you why. Good question. Yeah. Ignore all the other ones. How? Uh-huh. Right, we've got two competing things. We care less about the roots for this style, but for the species, we do want to see really good roots. And so it's somewhere kind of in the middle. So an average score makes sense for that. Um, what I'm going to do is, what I'm hoping is that the next time you go shopping for trees, you start looking at trees atomistically. Focus on the trunk. Americans typically are obsessed with the roots. The trunk is more important. Focus on the trunk and then look at everything else. Look at the roots, look at the branches, Almost ignore the container unless someone accidentally put it in a really good container. Dodi? Yeah? Looking at it, should you judge it in the style form or in the species? Both. And that's what we literally just said. I know. Right. At the black, they, they all apply. There are actually lots of different criteria we can apply to how we do this. And so... I'm judging this as a Bunjin-ish cork bark black pine. And that's my criteria for that tree. Does that help at all? If it doesn't tell me, then what else what else are we missing? Okay. Paul. I kind of expanding on what Dodi said, I think you've got to consider the style of tree before you can say it's the best or the worst trunk in the room. I mean, this may be the very best literati trunk in the room. It may not be as good as uh Sierra juniper trunk. So, um, but if I was just judging it as a literati, I, I'd love that trunk. Uh -huh. And so when it comes down to the practice of what number you put on the paper, you'll find that it probably won't get in the way. Um, you can kind of get a basic idea of what the average quality is on the table, and that's going to inform your score a little bit. But it would be really weird if I were to judge if we were all to judge the trees very differently compared to, I just got back from Japan and I'm comparing the trees to all of those, this isn't Japan, versus um, I was at uh, Walmart and they had a bonsai section and I'm comparing it to those kind of trees. And so uh, the point being is you're going to just kind of come up with some basic numbers kind of quickly. And then what we'll do is you're going to judge tree one, two, and three, and then we will come back and talk about your scores. The reason you're going to evaluate the trunk on a scale of 1 to 10 is that the bulk of the value of the tree is in the trunk. And that's the value in terms of what we appreciate about bonsai, as well as the literal dollar value of the tree. The value really is in the trunk. And we have an elm, a pine, and an oak. And we'll just leave it really generic like that. And then if we have time, we'll do another round just for junipers. And you'll find that it's actually possible to compare different styles and different species and I have uh, quiz sheets for you all. And so I would say, 
come up, get a sheet, and then evaluate the, uh, there's little spots for literally tree. Actually, I guess you could do all five if you want. We can do them all together, but you're going to evaluate the trunk on a scale of one to 10, branches one to five, the surface roots, the pot selection we talked nothing about, shoot from the hip, that's fine. The overall aesthetics is just, what do you think of the overall presentation? Does it make you feel good? Does it make you feel funny? Does it feel like it's ready for a show? Does it make you feel like it's not ready for the show? N no, I would say the average American applies bunjin to a giant swath of trees. And when, I, and when people in Japan hear that, they think of bunjin as applying to this many trees and they tease me for that. But we don't have a good word for towards bunjin or bunjin-like. Bunjin is a perfectly fair word for it. I just personally really hesitate to use it because I don't know how savvy my audience is and whether or not they're going to give me a hard time for including something. It's not necessarily anything with a skinny trunk. I, I, I guess I'll leave it at that. Whereas a very tiny number of trees, I would just say, I mean, obviously this is in the Bunjin style. That would be a very fair statement. But uh, I, I don't know if it would be in the narrowest interpretation. Okay, did any of you, did all of you score at least a couple of the trees up here? So my first question, was scoring trees harder than you thought or easier? How many thought it was easier? How many thought it was hard? Why was it hard, Dodie? Because I don't know what are the normal growing characteristics of each species. Because you want to know more about any species, about right. what to look for in the different species. Correct. Perfect example. What else made it hard? But did it actually cause a problem? The comment was five points wasn't much. It is a crude scale. Did it literally cause a problem where you're like, is it a three or is it a four? And like, is that what was hanging you up? What am I right. And that with, with 10 more minutes of practice, you'd get over that. So a lot of people want more points. And I actually did a study where we had hundreds of people judging trees and I gave them a whole bunch of different points. And what it turns out is the main difference between how many points you have to choose from is how fast and consistently you can score. If I give you more points to choose from, the odds drop off a cliff that you're gonna be consistent in your scoring. It might feel good to flatter yourself that you're such an expert of bonsai, you can precisely grade a tree on a hundred different independent points. But I would love to see any rain person come up with such consistency across every species. When we have smaller numbers of points, it may feel crude, but it actually comes out in the wash. Peter, is it harder with fewer points or do you want more points or are you kind of okay with a small number of points when you're evaluating trees? Because I know you've done it on a scale of five, for instance. Did that feel a little bit challenging at times or were you able to make it work? I, I was able to make it work. Yeah, at first it's uh, a little tough, right? Because you're jumping from three to four. But after a while, yeah, you can kind of how did, did you award ones and twos? Or are you one of those people who gave nothing a one or a two? I, I like to use the full scale. So I yeah. did give ones and twos and yeah. I and, too. and I mean, the, the deal is that one is, I would say, I kind of, I kind of use one as it's acceptable to be here. Right? Which is a great honor. It made and, it into the room. Exactly. And yeah. then kind of go up from there as opposed to three being the, the base mediocre yeah right. exactly right yeah and so that's a good way of looking at it where does it get two pluses or plus three or plus four this one's outstanding i'm giving it a plus five on that one. yeah so that so kind of extends good range. about all of them yeah yeah oh, thanks that's a really good way of thinking about it so other than Dodie's comment about it's hard to know what to look for in every species what else made it challenging for you anything else or is that one of the hardest things did you find this easy or tricky did you do the scoring And so what experience would you think would make this easier? Uh, more more time with trees, right? Just getting to see a wider selection. I mean, yeah. um, if any, any criteria, right? If, if you're, you use dogs before or baked goods, right? Like if you've only yeah. seen five cakes in your life, yeah, you're like, well, I don't know. I have a pretty limited reservoir of information. Exactly. Um, so just having less exposure these different species and so in other uh, words when i come back next year you'll be all you'll, you'll have to have it down like that yeah 
sure. There's a lot of species. Now, to challenge you, Dodie, on that, you've looked at a lot of good bonsai all over. You do have some idea if a tree is a good tree or not. And while you may not know the characteristics of every short needle white pine or every single kind of deciduous oak, you do have a basic idea of what to look for quality wise. Is that enough to fall back on when you're scoring? You can nod yes or no or. Not like when I judged at the expo, I felt like I was hurting the exhibitors because I didn't know that that was a good tree based on that species. And how often did that get in the way? Like 10% well, of the trees or 80% of the trees? I don't remember. It was almost it was too probably pretty low. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was probably only a little bit. So start throwing out some numbers on tree number one. What'd you all put for the trunk? Just throw out some numbers. Four, what else? Seven. Seven. One to 10. And we talked about that. The reason we're, and it said, that's why there's a sample score that says one to 10 on trunk. And that's because the trunk is so important. We're trying to reinforce that idea. Okay, eight. What else we have on the trunk? Four, seven, eight. What else? Just throw out numbers. The tree won't hurt the tree's feeling. Six. So pretty much everyone gave it an above average trunk. What would you, what would have made the trunk have a higher score? A little more taper. It felt a little chunky in the middle, maybe. What else would maybe give it a little higher score? Just for the trunk. Oh, you didn't like the way it had been styled, the forwardness of it. I would say the forwardness of it is 100% acceptable. Doesn't mean you have to like it, but I don't think of it as a demerit. In fact, I've seen some trees come much more forward. It's a stylistic thing. Any other things you would do to improve the trunk? Because when you don't give it a high score, I always want to know, is it because you do or don't like it or because you see something objectively in the trunk that you would have wanted to see more of? Would you, I think taper is one of the big ones. It is pretty heavy, pretty high up. But what did you think about the age and character of the trunk? The fact that it had bark. That's really good. What about the sturdiness of the trunk? And there is some taper from bottom to top. That's also very good. A little buttressing at the base. That's also very good. Um, for deciduous trees, there's two basic patterns for the trunk. You can either have a main trunk with branches that come off all the way, or the trunk can go up and split and split and split. Perfectly acceptable forms of deciduous bonsai. This is the former. It's more of a kind of a conifer approach where there's one main trunk and lots of branches come off. You see that? Elms can be done both ways commonly. Japanese maples, far more common to see a main trunk, trident maples, main trunk with branches that come off, whether down or up. And so a lot of those things sound like kind of subjective characteristics, but I would say uh, those above average or you know up into the, between um, scores of five and 10, or maybe even better between kind of six and eight, six and nine, somewhere in those upper categories are pretty good for that trunk. What about the, what's the next category of branches? Branches, what'd you get for branches? Three, three, four. So threes and fours mostly? There's no such thing as three and a half. If you give it a three and they give it a four, it's a three and a half, that's a three and a half. So what needs to happen is, so if this was your tree and I said you have three years to make the branches better, what are you going to do to get that to a five? Because you knew not to give it a five, which means some part of in here knows that you have improvements in mind for the branches there. Is the silhouette okay? That's one criteria. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I noticed that it looked like somebody had taken some shears and just cut to the silhouette rather than there being the care to have gone in and branch by branch make selective pruning. Was that on one branch or? Branch from the front, if you came around the on side of right the tree. There. Yeah. Well, so from what? So. So I would say I see different things on different branches. Some of these on a single branch on that first right-hand side, I'll see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven divisions on a branch that long. 
So some of them are actually extremely well ramified. They won't all be like that. There's going to be some variation. And so is it well, what you're seeing is maybe an abrupt taper that it went from a little bit too strong to like little skinny things in there? How do you fix that? Because again, you've got the uh, same clock I gave Cody. You've got a few years to fix it. So how yeah, do you fix that? I think you're going to have to make some choices and let let's when the bi branch bifurcates, uh -huh. uh, take the third one out or whatever, and make some room for new growth. And so I would say there's kind of two things going on. One is stylistically, do you like the approach of having a solid canopy? That's one of them. And then there's the concept of what's the structure of the branches like inside. I haven't even looked at the tree yet. But at a glance, it's kind of awesome how much density there is in this thing. It's uh, pretty great. It might be fun to see maybe a little more into the top, but the reality is I don't really care what it looks like with leaves on. It's pretty. I want to see it without the leaves, and that's how I'm going to evaluate it. And then it'll be a lot easier for us to see those divisions in there. But I would expect the branches on this to be in the four or five range. In other words, right near kind of the top of that. Um, I would expect this would have far better than average branching of the deciduous trees for pretty much any show in this country. I wouldn't expect there's like giant levels a lot better than that for here. It's just you don't see a lot of really dense, you know, elms like this. It doesn't mean there's not room for improvement, but you, you're getting into that scale where is it personal choice or is it poor execution? But I'd say that'd be pretty decent in there. What about the surface roots? What'd you all put for that? Four, five, any threes? Yeah. I think, yeah, three or four. You like to say four on average, give or take a point to be perfectly acceptable for that. We talked nothing at all about pots. What'd you give it for the pot? Did any of you want a shallow, smooth, colorful pot, a glazed pot? That's the convention for deciduous trees, so a lot of people would like that. But for what it is, it's actually a really pretty pot. And because it has such a heavy trunk, the heavier unglazed pot is actually not a bad match for it. But I'm curious what you all, we haven't talked about this at all. What did you do with overall aesthetics for the tree? Four, three. Was it in line with your other scores, or was it a little bit different? Or is it telling a story of a very powerful trunk within a compact frame? And so... I don't think of it as there's necessarily an answer to that. It's the artist is creating a story and it's it's maybe a different story than you would tell with this trunk. Because there's a lot of different starting points. If this tree were grown out and made rounder, it would have much more of an up and out form rather than kind of a densely silhouetted and padded form that it currently has. Yeah, I'd like that and still make it larger, but the trunk is too big for the tree. That just means the tree's too small for the trunk. Okay. <laughs> because you can't make, you can't shrink a trunk down. That's not a thing in general, really but you can't grow bigger. the tree out. Yeah, yeah, that's perfectly acceptable. And that's what I mean by, I really do mean that. Uh, this is a statement of a really powerful tree in a compact form. And by keeping it narrow, when you have a big trunk and a narrow silhouette, it over-exaggerates how big that trunk feels. As soon as you broaden the top of the tree or go outward, you can make the trunk look and make it taller. The trunk looks less big. But I'm also noticing this isn't much further. It's about you know, 16 and a half inches tall. That's going to be good for a medium-sized display. That's a display convention. But it's funny. I've never, yeah, I would, I would probably never say the trunk is too big. But the point is, you can grow the branches. And if the branches were this big, no one would be complaining the trunk is too big. Nobody. It's relative to the, that's my point. It's the branches are the thing to do that because we control the branches. That's our job. If the trunk's too small, you need a sacrifice branch and call me in 10 years, or you need some shears. And your sense of balance is different than the artist's sense of balance. Oh, and that's, right. that's kind of my point. Yeah. 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 And so we were talking about the root specifically. Oh, okay. When you talk about each species, can yeah. you talk about some typical ways that those species are styled? Yeah. Um, I would say in general of all the shows I've been to, I forget which elm is this? Is this uh, seju? In shows in this country, I don't think I've seen a seju elm 
this dense, maybe two or three in the ballpark ever. Does that sound fair, Peter? You don't see a lot, in other words. And that's like going to regional shows all over the country, the national show many times, and a lot of regional shows. I don't see this level of density. So at some level, I think of that as high technical merit. Now, I have seen a lot of trunks that are kind of like that, and this has been in training a long time because it has really heavy branches. I think the biggest stylistic decision is exactly kind of what Kitty was talking about, is are you going for a compact shape which makes the trunk look bigger or a slightly bigger shape? This is all kind of outside the scoring. It's more about kind of personal style interpretations. And because we've got a few more to get through before our break, I want to focus on that. But I would say this is a perfectly valid interpretation of an elm bonsai because people do a lot. Some people style them just like pines with heavy branches that all descend. Some go fully up and out and have very light and airy forms. This one branch wise is in the middle, but it has a heavy trunk, which just makes it look really powerful. The narrow silhouette exaggerates that. And so overall, it sounds like you, you all gave that a decent score altogether. Like what were, what were the total numbers you all came up with on that one? 20, 26, 23. Yeah, so pretty, pretty good numbers there. All right, let's go over to the pine. What kind of pine is this? Yeah, which white pine? Is it a Coconoe? Is it Zuisho? Is it Coconoe? Yeah, That's, that would not surprise me on that. Yeah, it's probably either the Coconoe, possibly uh, cutting from a Zuisho, but yeah, it's, it's Coconoe would be my first guess based on the color. And so that's the first thing I ask, because the size of the needles is going to make me think about what kind of density do I expect on, to see on the tree, as well as, you know, kind of what's possible within that form. What did you all give the trunk? Eight, nine. So pretty high numbers. Was anyone radically outside of that? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think those are really good numbers. It's a great trunk. What about the branches? So really good branches, totally fair. What do you think about the surface roots? Yeah, I'd give it at least a four on that. What about the pot selection? The convention in Japan would be to go with more of a gray than a purple. That's an insanely subtle point. I won't even say it's better or worse. It's just, that's the first thing that always comes to mind when I see white pines. Because a lot of people have gray pots and we don't have many white pines and so it's harder to find good matches for the gray pots. So I'm always thinking of that. What about the overall? Four or five, okay. So what could be done to improve this tree? There was not a lot of controversy about that. Everyone thought that was really well executed. You wish you could see the trunk better. I think it would be reasonable to open up a tiny bit more window at the very base. Yeah, that would be pretty easy work. A little bit of pruning and or wiring could do that. Is it too wide? No. No, that's actually uh, not totally crazy because the width and the size of the trunk. You could restyle this to make it more compact and it would make the trunk look bigger, kind of like what's going on in the elm. But I'd say this is within the norm of what I'd expect to see, say, in a Japanese exhibit for this species and that style. It wouldn't be crazy to make it more compact, but it's at the stage of development where if someone wanted to really aggressively go after it and spend, um, I mean, it takes an extraordinary amount of time to wire that many small branches on a white pine. It'd be slowest species. Easy work, but more branches than almost anything. Which way does the tree flow, left or right? Yeah, I'd say it flows to the right, but it is a little bit subtle. And I think that actually would be a really good kind of improvement to make. Actually, I could lift it up so those in the back could see it a little better. And that's the kind of thing I think about a lot for trees at this stage of development is to think about things like balance and flow. How do you make things clearly indicate flow? Even if it's a complex flow, maybe the top goes one way, a branch goes another way, and the silhouette points a third way. 
it doesn't matter what the flow is, but when you're clearly indicating what the uh, indicators of flow are, I think that's the kind of thing you can do. So in other words, all of those things are the kinds of things that you can learn when you buy a tree in advanced stages of development. You're looking at things like density, at symmetry, at optimizing the canopy, at figuring out the perfect ratio. So there's actually a lot you can only learn when you have a really dense tree. Whereas when you have trees um, much earlier in development, much less dense, you're worrying about very different things, like where does this branch go? Is it healthy? Stuff like that. So there's a lot you can learn from that. So what were your total scores on the wi -Fine? Pretty high. Was that the highest score for those of you that just shouted them out? All right. Let's jump to the oak. Is this a valley oak? English oak. Oh, wow. What did you all come up with the trunk for the oak? A one? Was that one or a nine? Nine. Whew. I was worried. Okay. Six, nine. What else? Eight. We didn't talk about broadleaf evergreens that much. What do you look for in the trunks of oaks? You've all seen oaks. Movement, specifically undulating movement. You can be a lot more creative in your trunk and your branch movement with oaks and other species. And that's why we're, they're one of the most fun species to play with because you can be a little bit loose and say, oh, well, no, that's how oaks grow. And you can kind of get away with it. What about the age of the trunk? Yeah, it's kind of awesome. Uh, what about the branches? What did you give the branches? So three is pretty low. Is the three, or meaning it's only three plus one it got in the room today. There are two more higher levels. Is the three reflecting the structure from the inside, the silhouette, or both? Really? So one branch just killed it for you? And so if I just cut that off right now, it would be better? Anyone have any comments? So this lowest branch down here in the back, that one? And so let's fast forward six years, because that's about how long it would take to let that thing run and thicken up a little bit. If that one branch were thicker, what would that three turn into? Pretty good. What did you all think about the fact that the branch, the primary and secondary branches are loose and airy, but the trunk was really thick with very fast taper? You see that sometimes, but it's not what we see in nature that often. Like, if you go up the bottom of the trunk, it's like a volcano. And then from there, it kind of turns into an oak tree. Did you like that? Did you not like that? Well, then you don't need to say anything else about it because we're going to say nice thing and not hurt the tree's feelings. The way I would talk about that is all of our bonsai tell a story and it's up to the artist to decide what that story is. I don't care what the story is, but I want it to make sense. And so on rare occasion, I think of this, if the trunk at the base were skinny, I would think that looks like any generic oak that I would see out in the hills all day long. It would be a more special oak that would have some crazy ancient massive base, especially if there was some deadwood or something funky, signs of old broken branches that then kind of grew up and out. That would make me look more closely and say, that's not 90 out of 100 oaks that I passed. That's one out of 100 oaks that I just passed. And that would make me want to look at it a little more closely and find out what's going on. Uh, and there is a little bit of deadwood on there. There's some, you know, a couple cut branches, a little bit, a tiny scar. But overall, I see age. And because it's all bonsai, which is all kind of half artificial anyway, I mean, these are little trees and pots at some level. It doesn't really bother me. And so, again, to really judge a tree, I'd want to see it without its leaves. But as it is now, I'd say it has a good representation of that oak feeling. What did you give the uh, surface roots for this one? It's hard to know how to score surface roots when the trunk kind of flares out, but you don't actually see any nabari. It'd be fun if we could see the trunk transition into a few more roots. Uh, we see roots in a few places, but in other places, the trunk just kind of dives into the surface. And so, but because we kind of count that lower trunk area as part of the surface roots, I'd say anywhere in that kind of, you know, 
three to four, give or take a point, I'd be okay with on that. If you just cut off one of the whole branches, one of the major branches. Yes. Well, and so that would tell a very different story. If you were to cut off one of the main bifurcations of the trunk, that's just you're having the size of the tree, be reducing by either 40% of the foliage or 30% of the foliage. And you're telling a very different story at that point. And that would actually exacerbate the taper going from very wide to very small and staying small, whereas at least when it's dividing into other things. So that's a valid approach to it, but it's telling a different story for that. Now, overall, if you were just to ignore the numbers, would you have obviously picked one of these before you started as having the highest score on there? Or is it just your bias toward conifers? Because a lot of people do like conifers, and that is part of it. Um, we can get to the junipers. It's about break time, I'd assume, right now. Yeah, we're about to go to the break. But if you'd like, when we come back, we can very quickly look at the junipers. But did any of you struggle with the fact that it were different species altogether here? Did anyone say yes to that? And what problem did it cause while you were going through this, making the scores? Whoever said yes, I heard a yes. I mean, oh. And that's really the secret is you're judging the elm as an elm. You're judging the pine as a pine. You're judging the oak as an oak. And as long as you are applying all of your knowledge to those species for that one, the rest kind of takes care of itself. And the reality is you're going to be at a nursery. You're going to be at Lone Pine Gardens or Lotus Bonsai, and you're going to see three trees next to each other. And you're going to look at the roots. You're going to look at the trunks. You're going to look at where the branches emerge, and you're going to make a decision about which tree to add to your collection. Oh, that one's so pretty. Most people just choose whatever has the prettiest silhouette. I'd say that's the last thing you want to do. If I could give you all two superpowers, and then we'll hit the break. Number one, I would have you all be able to see the trunk to the exclusion of anything else. Ignore all the branches and just see the trunk. If you can see the trunk clearly, you know what you're buying. You know what you're starting with. You know what you've got to work with. But if you have that superpower, it's worthless without the second superpower, which is the ability to envision what that tree could become. You need a little bit of imagination and experience to know, as you were saying, what should an elm look like. This is exactly what I would expect a fast taper, fat trunk, white dwarf, white pine to look like, exactly like that. Oaks can take almost any form. This is within what I would expect for an oak. People do them all different ways. Some look just like bonsai, and those are kind of boring, but the ones that feel more like oak are a lot more fun. So keep those two superpowers in mind. We'll do a little bit. I guess we're having a break for a little bit. I'd like to pick up where we left off. And feel free to move up to the front if you want. But I wanted to go over the junipers. Did you all score the junipers on your sheets? Want to cover the junipers? All right. So for this little guy, what did you give the trunk? 10, what did you give the trunk? Eight. Seven. Nine. I had to count, make sure you had 10 fingers to start with there. So this has a little bit of gin, but it has no shari. One thing that comes to my mind is I would probably score it a little bit lower because there are some really good opportunities to add more deadwood features. And so um, what I like about the trunk is that it has good movement and it's interesting. It gets really interesting and kind of convoluted in the middle. But I think you could actually bring out more of that by exaggerating the deadwood features on it. But those scores seem reasonable. I, I wouldn't go as high as nine because in my head, I just think for a for a tree that's about 10 inches tall, what's the best juniper trunk I can imagine? And I can imagine it doing loop-the-loops, whirly-whirls, tons of crazy deadwood. I can imagine really, really dramatic features here that make the tree look a lot older. But because there's so little taper from the bottom to the middle to the top and only minor deadwood features, I think at this presentation, there's a lot more we could do with that. What about the branches? What'd you give the branches? Four, what else? Three. As it is presented today, I would give it a three. If it were completely wired, I might want to give it a four. 
just because the silhouette's not totally dialed in right now. If it were wired, it probably would be there, but this isn't a show. This is a monthly meeting. And so that's about all I'd expect. In terms of the foliar density, one I always like looking against a clean backdrop. You can get a good idea of what you're dealing with, but I'd say it's not far off. Like a good styling on this thing is going to get the silhouette pretty much right where you want it. And then as it fills in over time, uh, one year from now, you could have a really nice silhouette on this. What'd you all do with the roots? Five, three, three. Did you give them threes because it's a juniper or because you thought they could be better? I'd say this for a juniper is fantastic. It gets a little bit wider right at the base. And for a juniper, I'm just like, hey, you got me. It's great. I don't want to see those big pancake bases you see on a maple that would look silly on a juniper, like really silly. And so I'd be totally happy if you gave that whether a three or four. Five might be a bit much, but like something like a four would be perfectly acceptable for something like that. What about the pot? Was the pot a good fit? I'd say the pot's about right. The shape's not the most flattering shape, but it's not bad. So I'd give the pot kind of a middle score, probably something like a three. And then overall, did you like the way it all worked together? So this is a case where it's like, I want the trunk to be a little, I want the trunk to be kind of treated a little differently. The branches to be treated a little differently. The pot to be treated a little differently. But all the basics are in place. Nothing really stands out. And so it kind of all works to me. But before I put it in a show, it could go in just like this, but I would want to already be thinking about, well, maybe this year it goes in like this. And then the following year, two years later, I want to completely wire the tree, really dial it in, shop for the best container for it that makes it as flattering as possible, show off the curves in the trunk as good as possible. Yeah. I was just going to talk about that a little bit. I would do it incrementally. And so I would do some shari to start with maybe 20, 30% of the trunk for starters. And then I would add to it over time. I would also think about whether I want to end up with two lifelines eventually or one lifeline. Now, one big tip when carving shari, do you put the lifeline on the outside of curves or on the inside of curves when you're carving? Outside, how come? If you put the lifeline on the outside, as it grows, it makes the curve looks like it's bigger and bigger and bigger. If you put the lifeline in the middle, the curve looks smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's exactly right. You always want the lifeline to the degree possible on the outside of curves rather than on the inside of curves. That's right. And so what I try to do is I'll often start with what are the curves I most want to show off? And I start my deadwood design there. And then I kind of work out from those points. Any other questions or comments about this guy? Yeah. Would I see this tree at natural scale or would it be a big version of that exact same tree? It'd be fantastic to see one of those in nature. That would make my day. I agree. All right, Sierra Juniper. What did you all get for the trunk on this one? Seven, nine, 10? Above average scores. What do we look for specifically in Sierra junipers? This is getting a little more refined. A Sierra juniper is a juniper, and we do want to see movement and deadwood and lifeline. But what is what are some hallmarks of Sierra junipers specifically? Paul, the big giant Sierra you used to have, what were some of the characteristics that that tree had? Yes. Um, Paul had a giant Sierra juniper that it very much looked like a Sierra juniper. Except it was grafted with Kishu. But uh, um, yeah. the uh, deadwood on Sierras is softer than other junipers, so it tends to rot away, leave hollows and, yes. and windows, uh, just a lot of a lot of contour to it more than more than the other California that's right junipers. you're way less likely to see twists on sierras and other kinds of junipers and so really old sierras sadly the inside of the trunk will often be rotten and missing and so you do get those neat hollows and often you'll just see the shell of lifeline around that the other thing you see a lot on on sierras is this kind of characteristic 
this kind of just choppy, interesting wood. Now, if you do see twists on Sierras, grab it because that's highly desirable. But I would say this very much looks like a Sierra. And so different people you talk to will want to score these differently. Some people think all junipers need to be judged the same. They all need to twist. They all need to have Shimpaku characteristics. I don't think about that. I think I want a Rocky to look like a Rocky, a Sierra to look like a Sierra. I'm very biased because I've spent a lot of time in the Sierra Nevada, and this evokes a lot of characteristics for Sierra. And so I think an above average score would be totally appropriate for this. Now, what about the branches? What did you score the branches on this one? Matt, what did you score the branches on this guy? One to five. Four. What would you get on that one? Three. What would you get this one? Three. What would you give it? People love it when I put them on the spot. Three. What, did he, what, what he said. Yeah, exactly. And so here's what I think about the foliage up here. How far up the trunk is the lowest branch on the tree? Really, really high. And where's the most interesting feature on the trunk? But pretty low. And so one, I can't, I'd need a third arm to be able to do this well. One way I evaluate junipers is, is I look at where is the foliage and where are the interesting characteristics. And this is a personal bias. I like it when there's good integration. So over time, I would want to train some branches a little bit lower so I can get some foliar, coli foliage, foliar color poking out on one or both sides of the deadwood so that I don't want to look back and forth between, oh, fun trunk. Yeah, in other words, if you drew a line right here, all of the foliage would be above the interesting part of the trunk. In other words, if I made a cut right here, there'd be like a five-year-old tree with no character up there. But down below, we'd have this fantastic, great tree with all these interesting features on it. I would want to get some foliage down in here, maybe something down poking out the back a little bit to integrate the design. And so I would score the branches just below that three line, you know, maybe down to a two or something, because I would just say the tree's early in development and there's more opportunity to really show this off and provide some depth behind it because there is some really good depth there. Now, would you score the roots on this one? Three? Yeah, they're not particularly great or bad. It's just a bunch of deadwood down there, so that seems a perfectly fine score. What about the pot? Kind of a shoes on design with the bamboo on it. I'll just let this be an excuse to talk about. <laughs> when we talk about pot suitability, we typically mean the size, shape, color of the pot compared to the composition as a whole. In Japan, they take that for granted that they don't mess that up. In Japan, when you're to show that whether or not the pot is good means no really is this a chinese antique is that made by the best maker is that the inherent characteristics of the pot that's what they're evaluating much more than the suitability because we're assuming none of us are ignorant about how to match a tree to a pot and so they're looking at no was this a very expensive or a very very expensive pot that's kind of that's kind of another way to think of it we're not at that level yet some people are but in general um what do you think of the style of the pot for the tree? Even without a score, just do you like the combination? Do you think it could be a little better? Yeah, the size is really good. The shape is fine. I don't know that it's particularly amazing. I don't know that it's inappropriate in any way at all. It's a perfectly fine pot for it. Overall, what, what do you think in your scores? And was that five higher than the component scores? Or was it right kind of in line with your component scores? Then it must have been a bunch of scales of 1 to 10 then if you had done it that way. So <laughs> because I think of uh, trees in terms of how they're displayed, because that's when we care about the details, I literally, the first thing I check is, is it under 18 inches? And like, I'm kind of obsessed with that is because whether the tree is 18 or 20 inches, I'm going to display it very differently. And it's very useful to have trees between kind of 14 and 18 inches tall, because then you can pair a tree this size with a second tree about that size, not both junipers in the same display. 
That has nothing to do with our topic today, but that's literally a uh, consideration when you're shopping for trees is how you're going to display it if it's ever something that you want to show. And so overall, which score, which tree scored better between the two? The small one or the big one? Big one, big one. Anyone have the small one? And what's the main difference between the two that do you think tipped the balance between them? Age. And what category did age come up in? The trunk. Yeah, it always comes back to the trunk again. There's more age and more character in the trunk, and that tends to be the trump card for all of this. So let's pull up. Do you have the other slideshow handy? All right. And so what I wanted to do for the last few minutes is give you a couple more opportunities to vote on trees that aren't your own trees. There we go. Yeah. And so I won't ask you to score the trees that won prizes. We'll have you look at some other ones. But these are some highlights from last or the first Pacific Bonsai Expo. And this tree received best in show, and some people loved it, some people loved it less. Any characteristics you do or don't appreciate about this tree, quickly, just shout them out. What about the trunk? Movement. For those who can't tell, this isn't a big ball. The trunk actually goes up and down and around and around the back and then swoops down and then back up. The movement's insane. By the way, that tree stands about this tall. It's huge. Now, what do you think about the branch development? It's a ponderosa pine. Do you want more development or less branch development out of a ponderosa? Is it what? I would say this is not that many years in training. And because we don't have as deep a history of training ponderosa pine bonsai, that's a somewhat open question as to how full do we want a tree to be. And there's a couple ways of judging that. One is, is the trunk skinny or is it fat? And that's one of the first questions we ask when we figure out how dense the foliage is. That's one. Another way to look at it is by the species. Is this dense or thin for a ponderosa? What do you think? In general, it's very good for a ponderosa unless you've been to Michael Hagedorn's garden and then you think he's not even trying. And so technically a lot more is possible out of the species. It's more a question of what do we want to see in the tree. And one reason that a lot of people didn't think that was maybe as befitting for best in show was the it looked like it hadn't been in training for that long. And so it got the golden shovel award in their mind. Whoever dug the tree up gets the prize, and that's kind of the end of it. Or was this a brilliant representation of the hardships the trees go through and the grace they accrue in their time in the mountains? Again, you get to pick the story. It's more a matter of, you know, kind of what we do with it. And so really interesting tree. I think the reason it was an overwhelming favorite in the voting was that the tree had presence. It was almost scary to stand in front of it. Up on the table, you're kind of looking up at it. You had to physically move to see all around it. Whereas little trees, you can kind of, yeah, I got it next. And then that one, you're like, wow. So that one had a big effect. But there were a lot of good conifers. Next slide. So this, interestingly, won best conifer at the show. You might have noticed the previous tree was also a conifer. We had a lot of discussions. I'll bore you with none of them about whether or not there can be a difference between best conifer and best in show. Ask me about that, and I'll happily share the story. But this was recognized as the best conifer in the show. Anything you particularly like or don't like about this tree? What's amazing? Deadwood. Really cool deadwood. How many of you have ever seen such a complex branch design on a shimpaku? Did you see that very commonly? Do you like that level of complexity on a pad design for shimpaku? It's pretty darn cool. And I know some of the people nodding saw the tree in person. How easy is it to make sure you have even density of foliage on every single pad on the tree? Does that just happen naturally, or does that take a little bit of effort? It takes a little bit of effort. In other words, there's a lot to appreciate in that tree. Here's one way to think of how well a tree is prepared for the show, and this is a quiz you can ask each other when you have your show next month. If you walk, in, if you walk up to a tree and think, you know, if I had half an hour, I could make that tree better, that means the artist put, didn't put enough work into it. Uh, Colin um, 
oh, what's his name, in England, that at Greenwood Bonsai, that was one of his comments, is he said, if I can make the tree better with a small amount of effort, then I can't give it that much due at a show. But if you look at a tree and you think there's nothing I could do very quickly to obviously improve the tree, then they did a really good job preparing it. So I wouldn't have you judge that one. That one came out fantastic. However, let's see the next one. This is a black pine. And that tree may not look it, but it's about this big. Big tree. Next one. Any guesses what this is? Coast redwood. Does it look like a redwood tree you've seen in nature? Does that matter? Open question. Let's look at the next one. Someone's nodding in the back with a big grin on his face. He's like, yeah, I don't know who that is. Yeah. And the next tree. And another Sierra juniper. So next slide. If you all had to rank these trees, one, two, three, four, would that be an easy or a hard job? If you had to score those trees just on a single metric, a one to five, would it be easy to do? So Doty had this job. And Doty, I'm going to speak for you and say, Doty found this challenging. Is that fair? What do you do when you see four really good trees? How do you decide how to award your points? You can make something up. I don't, we don't know. I, I did not use the full range of the scale one to five. I didn't do a lot of low trees, I know. But you will this year if your tree, if you get yeah, to be a judge we'll again. Yeah. And so how would you all approach something like this? Or do you just all put them in the top category and let someone else decide which tree gets the prize? Because that's the question I had, is I thought, wow, these are some great trees. I can either give them all fours or I can give them all fives. And then I'm that. what that means is I'm letting the decision of which tree wins, I'm leaving that to someone else. Another way to think of it is I can give one tree a five and the other trees fours, and then I'm stating an opinion. And in some cases, I did both. Sometimes I thought one tree really rose to the top. That person might have paid me a lot. Other times I thought they didn't pay me enough or too many people paid me and I, you could just leave them all the same. But would any of you even have a clue as to how to start judging between those? What Dodi had said is you go through your uh, matrix. You kind of you know fill out the different things and you start looking at, well, how's the trunk for a pine? How are the roots for a redwood? How is the deadwood for the juniper? How is the pot, the stand, and the display for the Sierra? Well, as we were talking about earlier, you know, you're, there's this sort of technical evaluation, right? And then at the, end, at the end of the day, I'm looking at how it moves me. Like, what's the story it tells and, and does that story matter to me? Yeah. So that's how I would differentiate. You know, you can look at it technically and evaluate it. And then that sort of overall appearance is kind of the tiebreaker for me. So rather than put anyone on the spot with numbers, Tell me one interpret, just pick a tree and tell me how you're interpreting the story. Like what comes to mind when you look at it? Pick any out of them. Top left, you know, lots of deadwood like that. It's something that's going to get hit by a lot of snow, maybe. And, mm -hmm. and something's going to be causing the branches to die. But it's not. It's a story it's, of harsh environment. It's a story of a harsh environment, but, you know, not necessarily like windswept or it might be wind biased, but it's not like... It, more of a snow story than a wind story. Exactly. Perfect. Does someone else have a story they would think of for one of these trees? Yeah, Nats. Amazing tree. It makes me want to not leave. And I just, like, when I look at those four trees, they're all amazing, but I look at the pine tree and I'm set, I'm like, okay, it's great, and I'm done. But I look at the other trees and I just keep on wanting to look at them. And it just draws me in, and I just I just want to keep looking at them. That's kind of a close different category. And that's a good thing to listen to. Over time, you'll start to be able to ask questions like, what is it that's drawing me in about these trees? Even though I can't walk away, what features am I looking at or not looking at? And so one thing I'd say about the pine is, I've grown a lot of pines over the years. I want the work to be better on that pine. There's a lot of things you can do with the pads and the branches. And I think I would want three years, two to three years to make that pine look significantly different. And then hopefully it would compete for your attention, you know, a little better. Anyone else have a story they want to share with any of those? Yeah. 
Uh -huh. um, the what one on the top left uh, is beautiful, but it's got this pad that's kind of coming up off the top right of it. Yeah. And if you were to take that pad off and leave the gin on there, I think it would be a much better tree. Would it be a better tree or a different tree? Like if I was going to give mini stories for each of these, the number one word that comes to mind for this is levity. What is it? And I levity. And yeah. I don't mean like levitation. I mean more like not jocular or joyous, but it it has a sense of humor. I do like all the gin. I mean, that's beautiful. You can't it's tricky to do that. And in person, the depth to, is fantastic. It's fascinating. It is beautiful. But if you were to take that pad off on the top, yeah. Look at what the apex would look like without it. Do you see how there's like a perfect apex? Oh, yeah, it'd be absolutely fantastic. It's a really good tree. And so it's an interesting artist statement to leave that up there. And But I think it could be like, if you happen to find that same tree and it was already dead, then you'd have a great tree. And that's what nine out of 10 people would do with it. 10 out of 10 or the 10th out of the 10 would choose to give us a little bonus up there because it's something to talk about and it's a guaranteed conversation starter well junipers are so great just to work with i mean they're just the best trees for bonsai they just lend them yeah. themselves so well but yeah those two on the bottom just look more refined and you don't really do that with a redwood on that bottom left but it's so sweet that bottom left tree yep yeah that's a fantastic demonstration of what you can do technically with redwoods it's kind of setting a standard of what level of density is possible. You get to decide if it's desirable, but there's no excuse to not make it dense if you want it dense. And that's just a very traditional cascade tree. Johnny Uchida found that tree when he was walking through the Sierra. He fell down, hurt his butt, looked, and it was that tree. That's, that's kind of where that one came from. But anyway, this was a really good example of how tricky it was. Let's go through a couple more. Uh, this won the best deciduous tree. It's a, a Coralopsis piccata, really pretty tree when they bloom. It has the yellow flowers that kind of dangle in spring. They're blooming right now. They're just gorgeous. But let's look at some other ones in the category. Washington Hawthorne, beautiful tree, won uh, best deciduous at the U.S. National Show a few years back. Japanese maple. Ginkgo biloba. And if any of you have ever worked with ginkgo, you know how insanely difficult it is to create or maintain that kind of density. And a Japanese maple, shishi gashira, or lion's head. Do you have an easier time picking a favorite among these? So this time we'll do it this way. How many of you would, so if I'm going to ask you each to kind of raise your hands when I point to the tree like best, how many of you like the maple best? How many of you like the ja this Japanese maple best? How many of you like the ginkgo best? Matt really wants that ginkgo. I just saw it in person not long ago. Really, it's such a pretty tree. And how many of you like the, the Hawthorne best? So the Hawthorne kind of gets the popular vote right here. I asked a buddy of mine who saw the show from Japan. His favorite was actually the uh, Shishigashira, the maple. And so different people like different things. But uh, what... For those of you who voted for the Hawthorne that was the uh, top vote getter, what made that one stand out among the others? It looks like a tree. There you go. Said the John Naka disciple, make your bonsai look like a tree, not your tree like a bonsai. It's got insane density, and I think that's one of the top things for it. It looks like you're looking at a giant tree out in a field. Um, height, dense branches are useful in bonsai because they help you create scale. It, it suggests a larger tree, and that's something that gets lost. It's not technically showing off. It's suggesting a larger tree. And that uh, Hawthorne does a fantastic job. Dennis Voitier does a great job with his trees. What about the uh, ginkgo? What, what did you all love about the ginkgo? It's just really pretty. I think a lot of people underappreciated the ginkgo because you don't see as many around. And the flame style it was what they call that branch pattern. It's not as evocative of tree. We don't have a lot of those that grow naturally around here. And we're just not as ex exposed to as many trees that look like that. Where these at least resemble, these two very much look like bonsai. That looks like a tree. And we're not really sure what to make of that when you're coming to this as someone new to bonsai. 
But again, that one, it's a really good tree and really well executed. It's in a beautiful Chinese antique pot. It's just a really nice overall presentation. And so I think you could do well to pick any of these on a different day. Photo-wise, I think this one looks the best because I just, the way the photo works, it's a small stand, so it makes the tree look bigger, but they're all pretty fantastic. What else we got? Oh, broadleaf evergreen. So we're going to show you two different trees, I, I think, I forget. So this is a ficus. Next slide. This is a cork oak. What's the next slide? Oh, I didn't put it. So go back again. I didn't do that. So what is your favorite between the cork oak and go back to the ficus? So how many of you like the ficus best? Now go to the cork oak. How many of you like the cork oak best? Why? Who voted for the ficus? Yes. Yeah. The branch density is awesome. You can see all the little fingers. The density is perfectly even over. It's a nice full silhouette. The base of the tree is massive. Got a lot of nice things going for it. Now, what about a spokesperson for the uh, cork oak? What did you like about this one? The density. It's a nice full canopy. Yep. The ramification on the branches is really nice for oak. The owner of the tree might be listening in remotely, so I have to make sure we're saying really nice things about it. The really subtle asymmetry. Yes, you can do really nice things with balance and flow when you've got a big form like that, and I think it came out really neat. And so if we go back to the ficus, uh, the, uh, or we can just look at everything else. You know, I can do that too. One more. There we go. I th so this took the top uh, broadleaf in that category. And my only guesses as to what would be recognized as excellent about it is the kind of precision and density on it. I think one thing that some people wondered about it is, <clears throat> is geometrically precise, perfect, dense branches evocative of a tropical species? I don't know. That's back to our artist statement. And I think we all have the room to interpret what is the story we're trying to tell about that? It was also very pretty, and it was perfectly healthy, and it had really powerful low branches. The upper trunk, however, is almost non-existent, and that the branches got a lot skinnier above that really massive base. Go to the cork oak, or the blue man group, either way. Is that Tobias? Mm -hmm. Hey, there we go. I talked a lot with the owner about this tree, about it. I'll make just a couple of comments. One is not everybody liked the solid silhouette, and that's an interpretation that the owner or creator of this tree really likes. He wants his trees to be full, and as a couple of you noted, that's kind of awesome to get a cork oak that full. Another thing that came up is a lot of people thought that some of the primary branches were slender compared to the size of the trunk. That could be solved with some sacrifice branches over time. And... Um, those are pretty darn subtle points, but both really nice trees. Next, here we go. So in the medium category, this is back to why we like 18 inch or under trees. It's common to show two different trees together and we wanna see contrast, maybe one deciduous, maybe one conifer. So let's look at the next few. Here we have a Hinoki cypress or Suara cypress and a Japanese maple. Let's look at the next one. Black pine with a chojibai, dwarf Japanese flowering quince. Uh, Yopon holly, native to Texas, and a Anitoigawa juniper. And then oh, I didn't get a close up. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeremy. I left out your uh, cork bark elm and an atlas cedar. I'm going to ask you to vote for each of these. How many of you like this one? How many of you like this one? How many of you like this one? How many of you like that one? Was this a little harder? Kind of like the conifer category, huh? These are all really nice displays. And so you start getting picky when you have to make a decision when you're trying to decide which ones to kind of score here. I will say that um, a good friend of many of us, Daisaku Nomoto from Japan, during his critiques, 
he repeated many, many times about this tree. He kept saying, Kokofu Ok, Kokofu Ok, that's the best show in the world. He didn't really say that about many trees in the room. He kind of ignored the prize winners, but many times he's like, oh, very good work, Kokofu Ok, Kokofu Ok. Maybe 95, 99%, maybe 100%. He wouldn't commit to that, but he thought that'd be no problem. That would get into one of the best shows in the world. So it'd be really hard not to recognize this display as being really good. What were some really picky people maybe downvoting that display is that the two trees were pretty similar in height. The shape of the trunk was pretty similar, primarily straight, primarily straight. Yes, there are multiple trunks here, but it's really hard to see when the tree's in leaf. And um, that's picky. I don't know that that's a reason not to vote for it when you've got such a great primary tree right there. And so what happened in the voting is a lot of people kind of split the vote. And a lot of these categories were very, very close because it's really hard to pick kind of a winner among them. And what's the last category? The last slide. There was one really clear winner, and this was the highest overall scoring exhibit or sh um, display in the entire exhibit. And so I will spare you from having to choose and instead ask, what are some things you appreciate or don't appreciate about this display? Yes, it's a great mix of species. And what other kinds of variety are there? Pots, the shape of the pots, the color of the pots. What else? Are there any things you could do to make this better? If you had unlimited resources, how would you improve this display? Yeah, you could. You could do more expensive pots. And that's probably the first thing someone in Japan would say. Write a check, solved. Would you choose the exact shape trunk on one, two, three of the trees, or at least really similar one? Would the most important tree in the display have a smaller trunk than most of the trunks below it? Would you have absolutely giant <laughs> trees in a shohin display? There's, and would you have, for one poor little tree's job is to balance five huge, beastly, powerful trees to have this tiny little trunk like that. So this was an outstanding display, and each individual tree is outstanding. But what's interesting about Shohin is the way we arrange the trees together is a big part of the scoring. And sorry, Dodi, I'll admit, we provided almost zero support for how to navigate that in the judging. We'll do 5% better this time, but there's a lot more to it. The short version is, in the top Shohin show in Japan, the scoring is pretty simple. You get 10 points for the trees and 10 points for the display. And the display is the arrangement and the pot selection. And that is pot quality in that case. And so when we look at the conventions, those are the kind of things that come up. These trees all share a buddy on a common shelf. That one gets a shelf to itself. And so that tends to be the most powerful tree. And that's why we tend to put informal uprights up there. And so when you've got a uh, slightly smaller tree with less directionality in the apex, it makes you think, well, that's a really impressive tree, or that's a really powerful tree, or that has really good movement and flow. You start thinking about, oh, there might be other choices to put there. This is perfect, where we have two deciduous trees crossed with two uh, leaf trees. That's really good. How do you make that better? Put flowers and or fruit on one of these, and then you get another form of contrast. Uh, one, two, three, four of these trees have stands. This one doesn't have a stand because if we lifted this one up, it gets a little bit closer to that and you want to make sure they're all in different levels. And so that was the right thing to do. You probably might have had room if you had one the right size. Just you can put like a little jita, a little kind of slab under that. And that's how you have something under there just so they're all the same. But I won't go into the details of that. And then volume wise in terms of uh, outline, that's an appropriate size, but the trunk happens to be kind of small. In general, the biggest tree in the display is going to be here. The most powerful tree is going to be up there. Smallest tree in the display is going to be right here. The strongest movement is going to be right here. These are very highly conventionalized, but they're all designed to kind of help you make the arrangement. Yeah. So uh, Kevin's asking three. if they all have to be shohin or if this can be a little bit bigger. And that depends on the rules of the show. And the reason I'm saying it that way is 
again, at the top Shohin show in the world, the Gafu Ten held at the Miyako Messe in January every year, there are about 15 or 20 different categories. And the five or six main categories are all set based on the size of the stand, which is measured based on, I kid you not, the width of the stand at the feet. So if the foot sticks out a centimeter on each side, that stand is the size of the feet. And that's why all modern stands all have flush feet. They don't want to be in a bigger category because the feet bump out. And so the 90 centimeter and up category, there's like the 80 centimeter category and up, 70 centimeter, 60 centimeter, based on the size of this. And so the ratio of the size of the trees versus the size of the stand will kind of determine how big these trees are. And this one will be a tiny bit bigger. That will those stand decisions will make the decisions about the size of the trees and some of them will be a tiny bit bigger than the maximum of in general it's going to be 20 centimeters or eight inches but you will see a couple that are eh, they'll give you 21 or two centimeters once in a while on that outside tree but in general they will be a uh, semi-cascade which gives them more visual weight as the, they're a longer tree but maybe the height won't be as big as the other ones yeah. Yeah. You've mentioned about Dodie being one of the people who judged the show. Yes. And um, now Dodie. <laughs> Dodie uh, loves it, being put in the spotlight like this. I know. Dodie's talked to you about that. There are things that she doesn't understand about bonsai. Yet yeah. she's been empowered to, to, to judge this show. Yes. And, um, I'm wondering, I know that you have, I, I understand why, but I'm trying to get the, I want yeah. everybody else to understand why. So, uh, so I'd like you to speak to that. Okay. And if there was some weight given to more weight given to like the other judges whom I assume were bonsai professionals. So what we did for this exhibit is we wanted to make it a, as transparent and community-based event as possible. And to do that, we empowered every single person who had a tree good enough to be accepted into the display, had the opportunity to join the judging panel. So every single person, someone might have just written a check, someone might have grown the tree for 40 years, we had some of each. And every one of those people that knew what it took to create or maintain a tree good enough for the exhibit could participate as a judge. We had a total of, I think, 43, 42 people eligible to be judges. 40 ended up participating as judges. The numbers kind of washed out in the end, and we published all of the scores. You can kind of see online every single score that everyone gave, every single display in the room. Some people, I would say, did a great job judging. Some people did okay at judging and a small number of people all say did an awful judge a time at judging and here's what i mean by bad judging when every tree in the room gets a three except for four trees that were all owned by the same person i don't think that's good judging and we didn't make a rule that you couldn't cheat but we did make it look really bad for you because we published those scores now i did it to my friend to make everyone hate that person so they thought it was that person's scores you know whatever but the main reason we wanted people to do that is for educational purposes. We wanted to expose people to the idea of what is it that we're looking for and what are the community standards. Depending on who you work with, you're going to inherit some pretty powerful biases. If you work with number one person, number two person, or number three teacher, they're going to have a way that they do things and really strong biases, and the odds are very high that you're going to inherit those biases. And we wanted the prize awards to reflect the community kind of as a whole. And we wanted to put the fire under the feet of the judges to try to learn as much as possible. And so the goal for tonight is not to just certify everyone as now able to go do the evaluation on your own, but to start thinking the next time you're shopping for trees in C3, to think about it in terms of the roots and the trunk and the branches, for instance to think what kind of problems can I solve? What kind of problems can I not solve? It's the next time you go to a show which is coming up right away. Now when you look at your show, you can evaluate the trunk of every tree in the room. You can evaluate the branches. You can evaluate the roots. You can start to second guess Tyler's decisions as whatever he decides are the prize winners. 
Tyler spent a full five-year apprenticeship at one of the most beautiful gardens in Japan with Shinji Suzuki. You'll probably hear all about it. Tyler's awesome, does great work, and studied in an absolutely amazing garden. We're fortunate that we have a bunch of people who study with good teachers really locally. And so we have some of that expertise around here as well. So try to pick Tyler's brain when he's here. But the main takeaway for you all is to think about what is going into these individual trees and to not be quick to point out the flaws without asking yourself, what would I do to improve that if it was mine? And then you ask the owner, oh, I noticed this. What, what are you planning to do with that? Oh, I have no idea. What do you think? And then they'll realize that you might have something to share about that. I've been asking Dodie for two years, a year and a half now, what can we do to help you be a judge next time? And by you, I mean all of you as you become in a position where you might be able to evaluate an event somewhere. And this presentation is a tiny step in that direction. And so as you have additional ideas, tell Dodi, tell me, suggest to any, whoever you're working with, what kind of support you think would be helpful for you as you are identifying goals for where you want to bring your trees. As Ian's working on his pine, what the next step is to make sure it has the exact silhouette in front and potting angle and pot that he wants for it. Probably a round pot, by the way, Ian, wherever you are. Well, your next and book, so, if you could write a book and go through each species and give examples in picture and in narrative, that would be helpful. So I would say, although I don't do that because every other book that exists has a page on every single uh, species and I found those not helpful. I did, however, just finish writing a new book. It'll be out in about a year from now. And the first chapter is literally nothing but advice to help you figure out what you should be buying. It's about starting points. And it's not just how to buy a good tree. It's more about what's a good fit for you. What type of work do you like doing? What grows well in your garden? Is it climatically suitable for you? In other words, two thirds of setting yourself up for success is finding the right starting points. It's literally the first chapter of the book. The second chapter is a bunch of ideas to help you think about what stories you want to tell with your trees. And so before we even mention a single technique, there's two full chapters just kind of helping you think through the process of how do you acquire material? How do you set goals for your collection? How do you set goals for yourself in terms of what skills you want to acquire and what you want those pretty living things in your backyard to look like? And so with that, we'll have more info on that later, whenever that's ready. Yeah. Well, Jonas, this has been fabulous. Have you all learned anything? And when you come to the expo, we, we did this last year, but in the program, we actually include yeah. the same judging sheet that we give the judges. So feel free to walk out and critique every last tree you see. We're, we're fine with that. We might do presentations on the topic as well, but you will have a chance in your program to judge every tree in the show when you're there. And we encourage you to do so. Yeah. Please don't miss the expo. It's a phenomenal weekend and buy your tickets early whenever they go on sale. Oh,